Scott, thank you for coming and welcome. Happy to be here. It's a rainy day in Sunbury. It's a rainy day pretty much everywhere, actually. Um, whenever your name comes up, one of the things that people uh, say, uh, isn't that the guy that's for property tax reform? So let's talk a little bit about that, where, where things stand. When we last spoke before the primary uh, in probably April, uh, you, you mentioned that you, obviously we know you were uh, a co-sponsor of uh, Senate Bill 76, and that um, you also were very intent on zero basing the budget so that maybe the 76 um, specifics wouldn't have to be at quite as written. So talk to me a little bit about where that stands and, and what you're hearing, I guess, from uh, people out there when you talk to them about property tax reform. Well, well Dennis, I think uh, you know, you've hit on a, probably one of the largest uh, issues in Pennsylvania, and that is property tax, uh, and specifically school taxes. Uh, there are three taxes, uh, you know, on a, on a piece of real estate. There would be the local municipal tax, there would be the county tax, and the, and the school tax. But as I cross the state, and I've been crossing the state for, you know, probably a little over four years, I've been hearing about this issue. Uh, seniors are losing their homes because they can't afford the, those taxes. There are seniors that are actually borrowing money to pay their taxes. So this is probably, um, I would say, the hottest issue when I, when I go into certain pockets. When I come up, especially maybe in, in, in Williamsport, uh, Sunbury, uh, Shemokin, Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, uh, it, it's a big issue. So my plan is, and I'm making a pledge, that if I become the next governor of Pennsylvania, I am going to eliminate the school taxes on your home. And how we're going to do that is through, through several ways. Number one, I was uh, a co-sponsor of Senate Bill 76. You know, I'm no longer in the Senate because I left in June, on June 4th to focus on this campaign. We're going to go to zero-based budgeting. And I believe if we go to zero-based budgeting and we balance our checkbook, we're going to find between one and a half and $4 billion the first year. And how I know is because I have a 40-year 40, uh, 40 business background in the private sector and I served on the, the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, what I witnessed as far as, you know, our finances of the state are just atrocious. So zero-based budgeting, balancing our checkbook, are easily going to find a billion and a half dollars and potentially up to four. Then we will look in the provisions of Senate Bill 76. There's provisions to, you know, tick the sales tax from 6 to 7 percent and, and raise the personal income tax. But as I've done extensive research in other states, there are items in Pennsylvania that are, that are not taxed, that are taxed in other states. And there are probably 20 different items. And I think, you know, there's an opportunity to look at some of those items and tax those items, which may not uh, require us to move that sales tax from 6 to 7 percent. Because all of a sudden, when you, when you raise your sales tax from 6 to 7, you know, you're not competitive with other states. So I think there's, you know, you know a, a broad look at everything. Mm -hmm. And, and I'll give you an example, and this is just one that you know that you really wouldn't think about. In 2014, I got a call from a local beer distributor in the 28th Senate District in New York, and he said, "Scott, come on down. I want to show you something." And he was able to obtain a record of how many cases of beer were purchased by rest bars and restaurants under the res restaurant liquor license, where they serve that that beer, you know, in their establishment. And so under the current scenario, when a restaurant or bar owner buys a case of beer, and I'm going to give just an example, there's 24 uh, Coors Light um, beers, uh, bottles of beer in a case, and you pay $24, you pay sales tax on the $24 or a dollar a bottle. So that would be six cents. And so when, he, when that bar owner, he or she retails that, that bottle of beer at $4, they are not charging sales tax on the retail side. If we were to not tax the wholesale side and tax the resale, retail side when that, when that beer is sold across the bar, that would yield almost another $300 million in sales tax. Okay? And if you go to any other state, they charge sales tax on the retail side. I mean, that seems logical. So the, these are small pockets of of additional uh, revenue areas that are taxed in other states, and I mean, who would who would ever think about that? Now, that's specific to beer. That doesn't include liquor. It doesn't include wine. So again, liquor and wine are being purchased on a wholesale side. You know, potentially, po possibly there could be 300 to maybe 700 million dollars worth of additional tax revenue generated because it's done on the on the on the retail side, not on the wholesale okay. side. Marsha, I know you want to talk about school. 
funding? Um, through school funding. Uh, education investment. Um, you were calling for a billion dollars in education investment without raising taxes. Um, this includes $700 million from a mix of privatization of the school and of uh, the sale of alcohol, which you were talking about, the leasing of liquor wholesale and welfare <coughs> reforms. Um, is this a 700 annual savings? And if, you, if it's just a one time. Well, no, we are no. talking about the funding that I'm going to be putting in the schools. You know, I've, I've committed to a billion dollars. Okay, and, and that, that is annually. That's not just a one-time okay. um, you know, uh, shot of, of, of capital into the system. That is on an annual basis. $700 million would, would, be, would go through into the school system through the 2016 funding formula. Mm -hmm. Then there, are, there, there is an additional $300 million that's still left, and that's broken up into two block grants. And, and the first block grant um, is available for schools that have STEM programs, yeah, education programs, programs documentable, and, and uh, you know, measurable programs. And That's 150 remaining million dollars that the school districts would be able to apply for. The uh, and then there is a remaining 150 million dollars, which is the Teach to the Top block grant. And that is a uh, block grant that um, schools would be able to apply for to reward top performing teachers. In the private sector, we reward top performers in industry. I mean, we have bonuses for you know maybe senior managers or specific employees that, that are top performers. So we're not going to just give the 700 million, or excuse me, the, the one billion dollars away, uh, but the 700 again, it's 700 through the 2016 funding formula, and then the two block grants of a, of 150 million. Now. You know, I want to point out that, you know, I've been getting a lot of criticism. Teachers the PSEA is out running around, you know, telling you know, all their teachers that I'm going to cut their pensions, I'm going to cut their pay. Number one, I'm the guy that's going to save this pension. Okay, because we have we are way way underwater right now with the pension system, and we have allowed underperformance of the pension system. We have overpaid money management fees. I mean, I'm talking significant amounts of overpayment in money management. The state treasurer just came out with a report I think in the last 60 days that we overpaid money managers to the tune of five and a half billion dollars, five hundred fifty million a year. Who who in Harrisburg is screaming about that? The PSEA sure isn't. The union bosses aren't, and the the teachers, and I think, need to understand that, that, is going to that this sure system is underwater Listen, and they're going to have a governor who is going to make sure that these pensions are paid. Listen, so, we're constitutionally you know, the obligated union to pay these pensions. Are all the and, teachers out and so, all you know, the, 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 the union bosses are telling all the Number teachers one, out there all uh, kinds of voodoo is, things is, that I'm going to do to them. Number one, education is the most is, important is, thing is, in a person's is, is life. The number as soon as they, one they, they start, item um, as a, and the most important child, thing in a person's life. As soon as they, they, they start uh, as, a, you know, as a child uh, and go the whole way through the school system, if we don't have smart people, we're going to have we're going to have an economy and we're going to have a society that you know is is, is lagging behind other other areas and other countries. Countries and other economies where we but don't have good education. That everybody needs so to ed education is that very, very important. For the last but four something years. that everybody and needs to understand and I'm that I served in the Senate for the last four years. And the so legislature, the and I'm going to be specific, the legislature that, that, that over the last four years budget, was the responsible that money party the that, that, that had so this money not, in the budget, this not Governor and Wolf that money went into the school system. Number one, Governor Wolf and so this was, not, this was not Governor so Wolf doing Governor this. Wolf this did, was did number one, Governor Wolf didn't sign a budget for three years. School so it wasn't Governor Wolf didn't do anything as far as school funding. But school funding went into the schools and over... Over the last four years, approximately two billion dollars went into the school system. That was put there by the House and Senate, and, and of the two billion, one point three billion of that just went to pensions. Not a nickel hit the classrooms. So, now I think we need to step back, and we all need to sort of have an adult conversation and understand that in my world, education is very, very important. I've had the opportunity to travel in many, many parts of the world, and you know, when I when I run into people, uh, and, I, and I recently ran into someone. Um, you know, down in the uh, Philadelphia area, was telling me that they're an immigrant, and from their country, uh, there are parents that will load their children up. And, and this one woman actually told me the story. She lived in Nigeria. 
Her parents to took her eight miles to a school day. every single and day. They were she dirt has, poor. She has, you know, she's Went to a school languages. every single she day, she and she has, country, she has, you know, she's learned multiple languages. She actually you come, she came to this country. She went to Drexel University. She has a medical degree. You hear these stories about what is happening in other areas. Our our children today need to be able to compete in a world economy, and we are in a world economy. And what's happening in other countries is just amazing with education. So. I just want to be, you know, very clear and crystal clear on this, that education is everything. And also, that ties into the skilled labor crisis that we have here in Pennsylvania. We have between 200 and 400,000 skilled labor positions. And if anybody doesn't think that that is an impact, that it doesn't impact the economic growth of our state, it does. Because you can't, and you can't find truck drivers and mechanics and welders and plumbers and carpenters. You can't grow your business. And we are, at, we've hit a wall. We probably hit the wall several years ago, but I come from the private sector, and I will tell you that I saw the the problem with hiring skilled mechanics. I saw 20 years ago because 20 years ago in our area there were less and less um, um, young guys, and especially because it's mainly male mechanics typically. And we have some. We we've never had a female mechanic in our truck shop, but you know they're not growing up on farms anymore. Lifestyles are changing, so. But at the end of the day, education is 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 everything, or we're going to be, you know, we're we're going to we're going to get stopped in our tracks. Well, one more question on education from my side. You, um, I, I believe, have been pretty well supported by uh, organizations, including Students First, that uh, support charter schools. Well, tell me a little bit about your position on on charter schools, private schools, and parents having that choice. Well, I I, I support a school choice. Uh, I support charter schools. There's a new charter school that just uh, opened up in York. It's the York Academy. I toured it yesterday, um, and and I'm, I'm I'm going to charter schools throughout the state. And I've been going, visiting charter schools for four years. Charter schools are there because they are they are meeting the needs in a community where the the public schools are not meeting uh, the needs. There are parts of Pennsylvania where you have really good public school systems. You'll not you're not going to find charter schools there because. The, the, the schools are, are, are producing students with, 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 with skills and knowledge that they need to compete out there. But when you go into, uh, when you go into certain areas of Pennsylvania, and I talk to charter school students, I ask them, I said, what, what are a couple reasons that, 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 that uh, were in your mind when you decided to change schools and come to a charter school? You know what the number one issue is? Bullying. They don't want to be bullied. I went to the char a charter school, in, again, the York Academy in York. Everybody's in uniforms. If you go to the public school system today, I'm actually just shocked at the appearance uh, of some of the students. I was in a, I was in a high school class in, a, in, in not an urban area, but sort of a semi-suburban area, and there were 11th grade uh, and 12th grade students. They were wearing shower slippers in class. I mean, it was atrocious, the dress. But you go to the charter schools, they have, they have rules. A lot of their rules are zero tolerance, and they also have dress code. And, and, and the kids are going there, and the parents are sending them there because they want a superior education. And they're not getting it in some of the, of the public schools. Well, you talked also about um, armed school resource officers. You're a proponent of that? Yes, I am. How do you pay for that? We find the money. Where? Well, you know, that's, that would be my job. You're hiring a chief executive. You're hiring somebody with 40 years of business experience. It's my job to find the money. And I can tell you the accounting. Should it come from the state or the local? It would come from the state. The state's going to have to find the money. I mean, listen, I, I served in Harrisburg for four years. I'm not, I'm not here to be politically correct. I, I ran to, for the state senate four years ago because I was fed up with Harrisburg. And I ran a campaign, I, run, I won a writing cam the first day ever in the state of Pennsylvania. I went to Harrisburg, and I'll tell you what I saw is disgusting. It's a, it's a financial game. It's like having 20 coffee cups. You turn them upside down, it's like, where's the money? Nobody wants you to know where the money is. And, and if, we, every, if we were a public company, every single day in Harrisburg, we are committing financial fraud. That's why I didn't vote for budgets. Number one, we couldn't pay for I didn't vote for any of the budgets for four years. In, under the Wolf administration. Well, I didn't vote on the budget this year. Um, it would have been three years. But at the end of the day, we're hiring, I'm, you're not hiring the janitor. 
you're hiring a chief executive of a very large enterprise here in Harrisburg, somebody who has ex the experience, and someone whose job it is to find the money and figure out how to pay for these programs. And trust me, we're not talking, this is not the only area. I mean, when you talk about school safety, we're talking about 15 other areas. If you want to talk about the heroin opioid crisis, that's another area we've got to find money. You want to talk about the mental health crisis, that's another area. I mean, the list, the list is endless of the problems and the issues we have in the state of Pennsylvania. This is not something that just happened four years ago. This has been 25 or 30 years of people being elected, going to Harrisburg, and not caring. And, and honestly, a lot of people being way, way over their, their skill level um, and voting on stuff they didn't even know what they were voting on. It's, it's really a shame. That's why we are. Our state is, we're on the verge of bankruptcy right now. I mean, everybody, well, you can't, well, that's not, it is true, I'm telling you, a $70 billion pension crisis and all these issues, I mean, I think it's time for the people of Pennsylvania to wake up and realize it's time that we're going to have to start taking the medicine, and you're going to hire a guy that's going to do it. I'm not a career politician, don't have an interest in being a career politician, and so, you know, I may not be politically correct, and, you know, I'm not endorsed by the unions, but I can tell you right now, when there's seniors losing their homes in Pennsylvania, and there are veterans sleeping under bridges, and we are losing 15 to 16 people a day to the heroin opioid crisis, it's about time we get an executive who's going to do what needs to be done and make tough decisions. It, some of them may not be popular, but I think the time is here. Can we talk about the opioid crisis? We, um, our United Way um, has founded the local opioid coalitions, and we're not making a lot of headway, you know, um, it, particularly in a rural area, I think finding the resources, resources are really hard to come by. You know, we're competing with places like Philadelphia and, and Pittsburgh um, when it comes to grant funding. What do you think are the things that are holding us back as a commonwealth? What do you, you know, what are you proposing to do about the opioid crisis and the mental well, health crisis here, we're facing? Here's, here's the, it's one word, it's leadership. Okay, and, and I, I, knew about the, I knew about the opioid problem in the early 2000s. I'm an employer. I employ hundreds of people. And I'm in the waste business, and, and, and you know, on a routine basis, we might have five to six sprains or strains a month, okay, where somebody sprains or, or strains something. We were sending our people back in the early 2000s to a med center in New York that were you know, part of the two hospitals. They were walking out with 30-day prescriptions for Vicodin and Oxycodone. Okay, and so I started questioning that, and I got pretty vocal about it. And actually, we, uh, because we were self-insured with our workers' comp coverage, we were able to we were able to, you know, you know, clamp down as much more than than, than most employers could because we had an arrangement with, with with that med center that they were only to prescribe you know over the counter, you know, you know, pain relievers, uh, and they could only within a you know a rare instance, and they could only prescribed so much. I saw this back in the 2000s. So here we are, let's fast forward to where we are today, and we have, um, uh, when I joined, well, let's fast forward to 2014. When I joined the Senate in 14, uh, Senator Gene Yaw from Lycoming County, who chairs the Center for Rural Pennsylvania, had hearings all over the state. And I went to a hearing in Reading, and I took our assistant district attorney, uh, some law enforcement folks and treatment folks to, to that, to that six-hour panel discussion and on our way back to York we said we need to form a task force immediately within 30 days in July 2014 we we, we formed the, the uh, York County Heroin Task Force we've been up and running now for almost four and a half years and there are many things that, that we have seen and I've taken a lot of time uh, over the last four years to become more educated number one we don't have enough treatment beds okay Number two, when someone calls and they want help, they're being told, well, it may be a 30-day wait. When somebody calls and wants help, that means they want help right now, okay? Not, not tomorrow and not next week. That's, that's, those are some of the issues. Number two, we are pushing people through 30-day treatment programs. And after spending, um, you know, an afternoon at the Karen Foundation in Reading, it takes an average of 270 days of treatment, okay? That's, that's, that's another large problem. And then, but the, the over-prescribing continues on a, very, on, a, on a very large scale. We have drop boxes all around the state of Pennsylvania, and I'm sure up here in Sunbury and in your county, you have drop boxes. 
In 2017, drop boxes around the state of Pennsylvania collected three million pounds of unused prescription drugs. And that's probably 20% of the problem. And I guarantee you that probably that an equal amount went down toilets. People were flushing because they have, that's what they, that's what they do. And, and so now you have the remaining 60% out there. The overprescribing continues at a large rate, okay? What we need to do, and this is what I would do as the next governor, very quickly and maybe by executive order, if I cannot get through this, this through the legislature, working with the medical community and the treatment community, but mainly the medical community, that we would limit the, the number of opioids that are prescribed. I mean, I hear routinely of mothers that take their, their sons or daughters to the oral surgeon, and they're getting a 15 a 15 day supply of a painkiller where quite frankly they could take possibly four motrins there's over the counter you know uh, options but instead of 15 days maybe it's 5 days we need to focus on this and this is something that our governor has not done uh, in fact we had a bill Senate bill 936 which went um, you know to the governor's desk i believe back in uh, May, and that was a bill that would have allowed it, allowed for all, you know options instead of opioids to treat workers' comp injuries. The governor vetoed that bill, and the reason he vetoed that bill is because he took 1.2 million dollars from a pharmacy pack called Fairness PA, which happens to be a pack that is owned by pharmacies, and the pharmacies happen to be owned by workers' comp attorneys in a, in a large law firm in, in Philadelphia, and also by a group of doctors who treat workers' comp injuries. So um, we also need to, uh, we, we need to focus on making sure that beds are available. We need to look at, at, at expanding the treatment uh, programs. But I'll also tell you that law enforcement needs more teeth. You know, as I talk to district attorneys and more law enforcement people, they know, you know, we need to maybe look at our, some of our sentencing guidelines. And I'll be honest with you, if you're selling heroin and you're carrying a firearm, I think you need to spend at least five years in jail, or maybe more. But you're gonna, we're not, we, we don't need to pat, keep patting people on the head and, you know, listen, don't do it again. And, you know, the, 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 the number of, of, of Narcan doses that are being administered every single day is breathtaking. And I think when someone is treated with Narcan, I don't know, you know, all the remedies, but I can tell you that that person should be um, you know, medically treated, they should be tracked. We, we need to get to the bottom of this. And where, where are these drugs coming from? And so, you know, I think it's a combination of, you know, you know making sure that we have beds available, making sure that, that we can expand our, our days of treatment. And, you know, this is, this is a very large problem. When you think, and, and, and the deaths, the increase in deaths, from 16 to 17 are over, I think it's over 30, it's between 35 and 50 percent. Over 10,000 people died in, in 16, 17. Because I just did, you know, a, a slide yesterday on this. It is a huge problem. Physicians are, are decreasing the amount of opiates, and I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. The emergency rooms, they don't get seven or eight right. days. Right. They get two days. And, and then go see your family doctor. Right. We know in the medical community that morphine and those types of drugs are not good for neuropathic pain, which is what we're treating it for. Uh, that that probably Motrin, uh, anti, uh, you know, uh, other other non uh, narcotic type drugs are much better at treating pain and getting people back to that. Mm -hmm. And so we are we are in a, trying to clean it up in the medical field, but I think we do do need some guidance. And I think that there's you know years ago we were targeted because we weren't helping people in hospice. We weren't getting enough narcotics. We weren't. We were making these people right. suffer. So doctors were sued. So they went the other way. It swings the other way. We got to swing it back. We, we have to re, be, be aware that pain specialists don't use narcotics. They right. they can get by with other things right. that are very helpful and will get less less likely. As far as the addiction, I'm on the drug and alcohol field in the, uh, in, the in the county. I'm on the South on coalition for. Our, uh, you know, what I see, um, uh, I don't see too many, I take care of a lot of heroin addicts and, and people who are recovering. I don't see too many of them get recovery without a 12-step program. If you go to caring, you're going to get a 12-step program and that's what we want you to follow. Unfortunately, when you go to the county, they say, well, we offered it to them, but they said no. You know what? That's the way to get them to sober. They need to be in the program. They need to be in there for long-term things. And these old alcoholics can really get some of these young kids sober and stay sober through the 12-step program. I think that's a real important there, thing. There are, some, there are some successful programs in Pennsylvania. 
and one of one of them happens to be in Washington, PA, and it's Mission House. They have an eighty percent success rate. But we talked about education. Um, listen, we have dropped the ball uh, in our public schools educating, and and I'll, and I'll tell you, I had an experience right after I joined the Senate. We formed the York County Heroin Task Force. I had an opportunity to meet with about I think fourteen or sixteen school superintendents from my county, and some of them were out of my district, but they were in, all in York County. I, you know, we, we, had a, we had an afternoon meeting, and I, we talked about, you know, my experience in the Senate, how I could help them, how I could help them mandates, and, you know, just, you know, you know let's, let's, let's work together on the education side. And then I told them about the formation of the Heroin Task Force, and, and I asked this simple question. To all superintendents, there was a room of them, and I said, I'm just curious, what are you hearing or seeing in your schools with uh, heroin, you know, heroin or other drugs? And I'm telling you, it's... I, my chief of staff was here and my legislative director, they all looked at me and said, we're not really hearing or, hearing or seeing anything in our schools. And I said, y you have to be kidding me. And I said, you know, I could go to any one of your schools and find a student, and I don't remember if I said $20 or $50, and give them cash, and they'll, and they'll come out with heroin. The, half of them won't even speak to me today. I mean, they're living under, they're living under a rock. It's, it is the fault of the administrators, the school boards, the teachers, they know what's going on. And and law enforcement people, when I told that story to some law enforcement folks, they were like blown away. But uh, we we have to be educating. We have as soon as a child goes into, you know, the ABC, you know, uh, daycare facility at, at two years old, they need to hear drugs are bad, needles are bad, drug dealers are bad. They need to hear this the whole way through. And and we drop the ball. And, but I can tell you there's other things, we're sure, we're sure teaching a lot of other things in the schools, but this is probably one of the most important things that, that, that we're going to teach. But here's the reality, a lot more people are going to die until this is over. This may take a whole generation to solve this problem, but on the flip side, we have to look at the supply side, we have to, where's the heroin coming from, Where and now there's fentanyl. I mean, law enforcement folks, they know, they it's know what's wrong. 50 times stronger. Yeah, they, they, they know what they want to do, but their hands are tied. And, um, you know, if you go to some areas, I mean, if you go to Philadelphia, um, you, you know, I, I've, and I've spent a lot of time down there, you know, the, the police officers in Philadelphia are not even really doing anything with the heroin addicts because they're not going to get out of a car. Now, I was, in a, I was in the Kensington area of Philadelphia, literally where drug addicts were cooking, they were cooking the heroin on a spoon, and they had needles in their arms, and we drove right by. And the police officers are not going to stop because they have body cams on, cameras, and if, 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 if the addict, you know, you know, starts to fight them off or stick them with a needle or whatever, you know, they, they, then there's all of a sudden a legal issue. Then there's, you know, then there's brutality. So it's become, in that city, it's become catch and release. Uh, and they're not even doing anything about it. And I think up, if you go into rural areas, every law enforcement person can tell you a, a specific, they can tell you, give you a specific instance of someone that they know is, is a user. They can tell you how many times they've been zapped with Narcan, and it just, it just continues over and over. This is a big problem. And it is costing, the amount of dollars that it's costing is, is just breathtaking. So, but I think you have to have, you have to have a chief executive who is going to provide leadership. I like your attitude of, 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 with uh, marijuana. You don't, Every heroin addict I've ever talked to, did you start? What did you start with? You know, they always start with the marijuana. That doesn't mean everybody, everybody who uses, you know, everybody uses a marijuana to go to heroin. But they all start with it. It's a gateway drug. It may be an extra drug. It may be help them get off of it. There's no doubt about it. That that's some studies out in that. But but you know, I'd like the attitude that you know what? It's a brain. It's a brain disease. And when you give marijuana, you affect the brain. So that if you give one, if someone smokes for once a, once a week for 10 years, they do an IQ to begin with and they do an IQ at the end, they've lost 10 points IQ. So that's, a, you know, that's brain, it's, so we don't know all the effects of marijuana, especially the high potency marijuana. Well, that's important. I, I think, think I, I like your attitude about yeah, that. I mean, I, I didn't clear. I was, yeah. a, I was a supporter of the medical marijuana initiative, the medical cannabis. I, I think we need to understand, you know, what what we can do with with the different oils. Sure. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm familiar with some people that have 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 used that treatment, uh, but I can also tell you that that we're moving into a dangerous ground. When I hear the the uh, the governor or the auditor general. 
and, and others and, and the Attorney General saying, well, we should legalize recreational. Look at all the tax dollars it's going to bring in. Oh, yeah, so this is, so it, it's, this is all about tax dollars. And then we look at gambling, uh, you know, all the forms of gambling, because it brings in more tax revenue. I mean, how about if we have start employing people? If we, if we employed 200,000 more people in this state, we found, we found the people to fill skilled labor positions just at $50,000. That's $10 billion in additional payroll. They're going to spend money. They're going to pay taxes. I mean, that's, that is, that's the bricks and mortar foundation of where you generate taxes from, not all this sin stuff. So, right. Bill, I agree. Yeah. Um, you talked about already, you know, increasing the penalty for uh, dealers and things like that. I'm curious about um, on your agenda the lawsuits against pharmaceutical companies. Sort of, if you can be a little bit more specific on that. Sort of your intention behind that. Well, I've, I've uh, you know, in my in my opioid uh, plan that I put out several weeks ago. Yeah, we are, we're going to go after. I will instruct the attorney general and work with the attorney general to go after. You know the drug companies that are specifically, you know, um, you know, manufacturing and dispensing opioids. L listen, th there has to be some. There has to be some. I think some internal accountability. Listen, if you're shipping, if you're shipping, you have one doctor in somewhere in Kentucky, and you're shipping, you're shipping enough pills or opioids to that one specific practice, and it's equal to five practices or ten practices in Sudbury, Pennsylvania, you, you, I'd say there's a problem. Sure, and, we just uh, had, a, we had a doctor here in the southern part of Northumberland County that I think uh, distributed six million pills over three years or four million, uh, four, three years, something like that, and it was out of one single doctor's office. Yeah. That, and I was after him for ten years now. But I'm I'm saying this is what's happening. People have to understand, this is not every pharmaceutical company. This is limited to, you know, you know, just you know, a handful. And it's not, you know, there are there are there are, there are drug companies that, that have you know that, that are you know manufacturing you know statins for cholesterol. So and, and there's other medications. I mean we know there there are a lot out there, but you know the, the opioids are are manufactured by a handful and it doesn't it I mean it doesn't affect the whole pharmaceutical industry. I mean there are some Drugs that are that are very very needed, you know, for people to you know to um, you know treat for different illnesses and different symptoms. But no, absolutely, the, the the companies that have profited, I think, need to pay. It's kind of a, on a different topic. The, uh, the House, I believe, today is is poised to vote uh, on extending the statute of limitations for uh, people who are uh, sexually abused. Where do you stand on that, and uh, do you agree with that uh, proposal? Um, I'm I'm not. Again, I'm out of the Senate. I don't know the language of the ex the specific bill, but I am and I am supportive of extending that. Yes, it's um, and then uh, sort of related. We've also there was some talk about um, doing some legislation on um, there as a result of the the Me Too uh, movement and all the uh, cases of abuse uh, or uh, sex sexism by uh, elected officials and not allowing that taxpayer dollars to be used. To pay for those uh, settlements that uh, get reached, um, nothing has happened there. Uh, is, is that something you also uh, would be of support of? Yes. I mean, number one, I you know I see periodical reports or periodic reports of you know money being paid out you know by 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 different entities, which in 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 uh, if you really do your research, it's taxpayer dollars, and that's wrong, completely wrong. Okay. Now, I know for a fact, I've read your response to these ads that have been on TV lately, that you're, you're not trying to tax people's retirement. Uh, talk to me a little bit about where that came from, because uh, they do have you on video saying something, in, in your words, subsequently out of context. Talk to us a little bit about that and uh, what you were referring to. Well, you're going to see a lot of, you're going to see a lot of commercials over the next uh, four to five weeks, and they're going to paint me as a really bad guy. The governor will probably, and outside interest, will probably spend probably north of twenty million dollars on ads, and they're they're going to paint me as the voodoo guy, and I'm going to do a lot of things to a lot of people, and so they pick seniors first that I'm going to take. I'm going to tax their retirement, and next thing they're, they're going to come out and tell people I'm going to take their wheelchairs and their homes and their kids, and that's totally wrong and totally false, and I want to be clear on that. This governor and his campaign, it's, 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 it's outright lies. But let me tell you where it came from. When I joined the Senate in 2014, 
I went to Harrisburg knowing there was a pension crisis, and that pension crisis is $70 billion. And in 2016, uh, Penn Live, the Patriot in Harrisburg, published an article, and the article, uh, or published the, the 100,000 club list. And when they published that article, there were 983 people that were receiving pensions from the state of Pennsylvania over $100,000 per year. So the top two pension recipients are, uh, are former Penn State administrators. The top guy, number one person in 2015 who received a pension from the state of Pennsylvania was a former Penn State administrator. He received $477,000 in 2015. And then the second person received four hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars, and I'm, you know, I'm having this conversation in front of a large, uh, you know, political audience, and I said, you know, here's something else that's interesting. We don't tax retirement income in the state of Pennsylvania, so these guys are getting off scot-free. They took a four to five-minute uh, conversation uh, that I had and took seven seconds, and they're using that that, you know, that I'm, that I'm uh, going to tax senior retirement. But furthermore, as I went on to, to explain to everyone, if you take the top 25 pension recipients, 13 of the top 25 are former Penn State administrators or employees, and if you take those top 13 and you total their pensions together and divide it by 13, the average is $268,000 a year. Now, when I look around Pennsylvania and I see seniors losing their homes, and I see I mean, this has been this this pension system has has been really good for a lot of people, and it's been bad for you know probably 50 times more. So that's where that comment came from. But I am absolutely you know not going to tax retirement income. But furthermore, in 2014, when Governor Wolf campaigned, he talked about property tax relief. You know, how's that working out for everybody? That never happened. So you have a governor who is making a pledge that I'm going to eliminate the school taxes on your home period. And, you know, we've been hearing this for 20 years. And, and I think I, as I step back and, you know, I was, you know, explaining to Marshall, but I, I don't need this job. And I don't need the income and I sure don't need the aggravation in my life. But after I went to the Senate for a reason, I knew Harrisburg was going to be bad. I got there. And after seeing how bad it is, you know, I'm one of those, I'm one of those individuals that I'm not going to stand on the sidelines. I'm going to do something about it. And, and, Someone told me last week or two weeks ago that the thought of you in Harrisburg terrifies people. And I'm like, I'm just a guy with a couple garbage trucks trying to make a living, okay? And I terrify people. The reason I terrify them is because I ask questions. And I'm going to continue to ask questions until I get the answers. I want to know how much money's in that account. Where did it come from? How much do we spend a year? How much comes in a year? I'm going to ask a lot of questions. And when I start asking questions, it, it makes people nervous. And I guess, you know, nervousness turns into, you know, you know, terrifying them. So I'm going to continue ask, to ask questions. But again, back to the seniors. The, for the first time, the seniors will have optimism in a governor to, re, to eliminate the school taxes on their homes. Okay. Um, more? Okay, well, I have a few more. The... Um, the uh, latest r reports out seem to indicate that uh, as far as fundraising between June and September, that you're at like 3.6 million. I think uh, the Wolf campaign is at 7.3 million. I, I, you know, knowing you're certainly uh, self-sufficient in many ways, uh, is, that, is that an issue for you? Uh, l listen, the governor has a huge advantage uh, over, over my campaign because the governor takes uh, 1.2 million dollars from a pharmacy pact. He takes, uh, he's taken almost two million dollars from the PSEA. He's taken almost uh, probably in the neighborhood of 10 million dollars just from, you know, from uh, public sector unions. So he has a huge. When when a governor has the ability to get a million dollars from a union, that's a big deal. Where I have to go out and raise a million dollars at, you know, 50 dollars, 100 dollars, 200, whatever. But I think, number one, we raised uh, a significant amount of money uh, over this last period. Uh, we're doing well, and we're going to continue to raise money. I'm making the calls, uh, so I know people, they want to see change, and money's coming in. But I think something that is, that is important, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big tracker of, 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 of a lot of information, but we now are approaching probably close to 10,000 donors that have um, made contributions. 
and and of those we have probably about 4,000 that have made multiple contributions and then we are somewhere around 6,000 contributors that are between zero and a hundred dollars I mean we have five dollar contributions and ten dollar contributions so you know I'm 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 getting a lot of money from from the grassroots effort I'm getting it you know by going out and meeting people on the street and I think that's significant but listen we're gonna uh, you know we're going to compete and and we're going to we're going to win this. So I am, you know, what I'm doing that's different from the governor. Governor, you know, I've uh, last Friday evening I attended an event. It was my 600th event this year. Now this is a this would be considered you know something I attract whether it's a meeting or an event or an interview. Mm -hmm. But I, I cracked 600 last Friday evening, and I'm around the state and that's just this year. But I've been around the state for the last four years. So I'm talking to the farmers, the veterans, the seniors, people in truck stops, people in diners. You know, you know, people that are making Pennsylvania, you know, operate and, uh, you know, making everything move in Pennsylvania. So, you know, w you know, I'm very optimistic that we're going to do well. But money, we're going to raise the money. Next, uh, next Monday night in Hershey, you, Alex Trebek, and the governor for 45 minutes from what I've read. Um, I know most incumbents don't like to debate. I know most challengers do like to debate. Uh, of the three candidates we've had in this room so far in the last two weeks, all three have been challengers. We're still working on getting some of the incumbents to come talk to us. While it's probably frustrating and annoying that you're not getting more debates out of the governor, do you see it at all as something, hey, four years from now, Scott Wagner's been governor for four years. Is, was Scott Wagner going to do a bunch of debates as, as an incumbent? Well, number one, uh, when I'm governor, uh, I will come out. And I'll do town halls and I'll do debates. I, I'm, listen, I'm comfortable talking to people, and I've had, I believe, 12 town halls, 12 or 13 so far. Um, you know, I had, you know, I don't know how many debates, but you know, quite a few in in the primary. But I, I think if you're afraid to go out and talk to people, that's a big deal. But the reason this governor does not want to do another debate because he doesn't want to give me the opportunity to ask questions, and he's sure not going to do town halls because there are a lot of people that want to know. They want to know what he's done. They're going to ask him about certain things. And, you know, if, listen, the question that everybody's asking, and I ask people, what has this governor accomplished in the last three and a half years? Name one single thing. We have more potholes than we've ever had in this state. We have more grass, uh, you know, more growing grass along highways, more trash. Um, you know, the, her the heroin opioid uh, problem is the number of deaths are increasing on his watch. So, there's not a lot that this governor can stand in front of people and say that he's accomplished. He's hiding. He do, he wants to hide, and he figures that. I mean, actually, I, I find it intriguing that he thinks that our campaigns are really, you know, uh, you know, you know, handling the debate side, and we're you know everything's out on the street. Listen, people want they they have a right to ask questions and um, and get answers, but there there are a lot of things about this governor. He continues to run around. Now he's saying he's a small business governor. Well, I can tell you a lot of small business uh, owners haven't had any relief over the last four years. I operate businesses. The regulatory agencies are tougher and tougher to deal with today. They're actually tougher today than they were four years ago, and they need to be reined in. But, you know, he also tells everybody he lives in, uh, he, live, he, maintain, he maintains a home in Mount Wolf, Pennsylvania. I mean, this governor is just, he, he continues to just tell, you know, little white lies, you know, you know lie after lie. He maintains a home in, in Mount Wolf, Pennsylvania. He actually lives in Philadelphia. He flies on a state-owned aircraft from Philadelphia to Capital City three to five times a week, and he has more security than any governor's had because there's, there's a security detail at the mansion, the governor's residence, there's one in Mount Wolf, and there's one in Philadelphia. And, um, you know, this, go this governor thinks money grows on trees. But, no, I, it's, it's really a tragedy that he's not willing to do more debates and town hall meetings. I have one more, added, almost a curiosity. You're campaigning as uh, as a tandem with with Bartos. Yes, that's not usually the way it, it works here, or has it worked in most states I've lived in, when where there was a lieutenant governor, sort of traditionally separate. What uh, brought you to to do it that way, and is is it successful for you so far? Well, very interesting question. I met Jeff Bartos in January, February of last year, 2017. And, and he was at that point, um, you know, starting his campaign for the U.S. Senate. So I, I, I traveled with Jeff a lot, and I was at many, many, many events uh, uh, that Jeff was at also presenting. So I just watched uh, Jeff's campaign, 
and, and, and during the beginning stages of the campaign, Lou Barletta had not entered the, the Senate race. So uh, Lou Barletta entered the Senate race, and I know Lou, Lou has a lot of support up in the Northeast where he's from, the scranton wilkes barre area. So I, I just, you know, I, I didn't see Jeff getting that support, and, and that would have been an issue for his campaign. So towards the end of the summer, uh, we had a conversation, and, I, and again, I watched Jeff. Uh, I think he's a, a very bright young man. He's an attorney. He's a business owner. He's very articulate. Uh, and he's, you know, deep down inside, I think he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good, genuine, soul of the earth person. So I made a comment. I said, you know, it's really a shame you're not running for, you know, lieutenant governor, because I think you'd be a great lieutenant governor. But I also live in a world uh, where I select, I select my, my management team in my companies. And in the current process that we have now, um, you know, for example, Governor Wolf is stuck with John Fetterman. I mean, you know, you know, I think that was a surprise. And here you have, here you have a governor who has been painted as the most liberal governor running with a lieutenant governor who is a self-proclaimed socialist. I mean, this is really, if you look at the Wolf Fetterman ticket and that team, it's you know that it makes you scratch your head. So I've had an opportunity to to really. Get to know Jeff and 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 understand what his what his skills what his skills are and what he's good at, and um, it's you know listen I'll I'll be the first to admit I'm not, you know I'm not the perfect candidate I have shortcomings and I think uh, you know in life you know having an opportunity to have someone who who complements my shortcomings Jeff is very articulate on certain issues um, you know I you know he's articulate I'm passionate you know he come he's more of a He's a, uh, you know, he's a dot every I, cross every T type person. I'm an operations guy. Uh, I, I know how to get the trash off the streets. You know, I know how to fix potholes. Well, we're not going to be fixing potholes. We're going to be putting more macadam down, more blacktop. I mean, if, we, if our agenda is just to fix black uh, potholes, that's all we'll be doing. But I think Jeff is, uh, it, it, I'm also looking for someone who that is going to work with me because the problems we have in Pennsylvania are just breathtaking, and it's going to take a, a, a heck of a team and a lot of energy, and it's also going to take a lot of House and Senate members that are going to have to step up, and we're going to have to start taking action and moving fast because some of these. I, and I asked that question uh, just out of curiosity, but also a lot of people over the course of time have suggested that maybe the lieutenant governor was a superfluous position uh, in, in the state government. You don't agree with that, obviously. Well, I think if you go into a large, this, listen, we're running about an $80 billion enterprise. I mean, we, we would be a Fortune 50 company if we if we were ranked with revenue and employees. And, and every company that I'm aware of has a CEO, they have a president, they have a chief operating officer. And so, you know, there isn't a chief operating officer. There's the, there's the, there's the governor, and then everything just runs itself. And and I, and I mean that when I say that these agencies, for the most part, are just running themselves. There's no oversight, but definitely by this governor. The agencies are secretaries are appointed. You have the deputies, and you know we have we we have a we have a pretty significant swamp here in Harrisburg that that we need to drain. Um, but you know, again, we don't have a chief operating officer in government, and that's 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 probably why we have the problems we have. Okay, well, uh, Scott, I appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Everybody else uh, asked all the questions they want to ask. Thank you so much. Thank for you coming very much. In. Thank you.